Breaking tonight, Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home searched by the FBI. What happened and the former president's incendiary response? The shadow on the ice on the eve of the World Junior Hockey Championships. Supporting them with my hard-earned money, not a choice I would make right now. The impact of the Hockey Canada sexual assault scandal. Film star, pop star, and iconic talent. Accolades and memories after the death of Olivia Newton-John. We feel very grateful that this is still a part of everyone's... They love it. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. We begin with some breaking news out of the U.S. Former President Donald Trump says tonight... His Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida was raided by the FBI that a large team of agents searched his home and broke open a safe. So this is outside Mar-a-Lago tonight. There are police outside the gate, supporters of the president gathering nearby, some of them waving those Trump flags in a show of solidarity. Katie Simpson is tracking the developments for us in Washington. So Katie, can you walk us through what we know so far? It doesn't get more significant than this, Adrian. It is unprecedented and it is politically explosive. For the FBI to be given the green light to search the home of a former president, analysts say it would require top levels of approval from the Department of Justice. Donald Trump broke the news himself in a statement saying his home in Mar-a-Lago was under siege, raided and occupied by a large group of FBI agents. He says this unannounced raid on my home was not necessary or appropriate, and that they even broke into my safe. What's the difference between this and Watergate? No one from the Department of Justice is commenting yet, but multiple U.S. news agencies are reporting this has to do with the mishandling of confidential documents. When Trump left office, he took 15 boxes of sensitive materials from the White House that he was not supposed to take. Some documents were returned to the National Archives after threats of legal action, but this raid suggests items are outstanding. Now, we already knew the Department of Justice had been looking into Trump's associates and some of Trump's actions on a range of issues, mainly the lead-up to January 6th. So this is yet another looming threat hanging over the former president. And so, Katie, aside from the statements that we saw, how is Trump trying to sort of frame or, or even spin this? Well, Trump is doing exactly what we've seen him do in the past. He's casting himself as the victim of a political witch hunt, the claims claiming the Justice Department has been weaponized as a way to prevent him from running again in 2024. His news release even had a link at the bottom for donations, so Trump is trying to make money off of this. His allies are acting as his loudest defenders right now. Steve Bannon went on the Trump-friendly Fox News network to essentially declare this as an act of war, saying Republicans need to win elections and go after Democrats. Trump followers, the true believers, do not trust the government. They think the election was stolen. This is only going to fuel that movement, and we're seeing the people around Trump already start to tap into it. All right, Katie Simpson in Washington, thank you. Thanks. So tonight, millions of fans around the world are grieving the sudden loss of a true superstar. As a singer, Olivia Newton-John sold more than 100 million albums. And she, of course, starred in that giant movie musical that still earns her new admiration. Like her character in Greece, Newton-John changed her image more than once, actually. And the fans just follow. Lindsay Duncombe shows us a career of great distinction and a cherished co-star who is saying goodbye. Let me be there in your morning. Let me be there in your life. Country love songs propelled Olivia Newton-John to stardom. She had a warmth in her voice, in her smile. I love you. Newton-John began performing as a teenager in Australia. She competed for England, where she was born, in the Eurovision Song Contest, racking up hits and awards through the 70s. Hopelessly devoted to you. Then this. In the movie musical Grease, Newton-John played Sandy, 
wholesome new girl hopelessly devoted to bad boy, good dancer, Danny Zuko. Fans loved it. They still do. So we feel very grateful that this is still a part of everyone's... They love it. Newton John made a lifelong friend in her Greece co-star, John Travolta. He wrote today, You made all our lives so much better. Your impact was incredible. Signing, your Danny. After Greece, Newton John's style moved from warmth to heat. Some radio stations wouldn't play this song. Too sexy. An evolution Newton John embraced. You've got to feel comfortable with what you're doing. And so I guess it just was a development. Olivia Newton John was first diagnosed with breast cancer in the 90s. The disease would return. A tumor in her spine meant she had to learn how to walk again. She shared her suffering, her time, and money to fund treatments and a cure. She wasn't a complainer. I don't think I'd change anything because I've had such an amazingly interesting life and done so many things. Things so many of us had the joy of watching. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. There is growing pressure to finally solve the chronic travel problems at Canada's airports, where some stranded passengers are being reduced to sleeping on the floor. We need actual help to stay the night. Like, what are we going to do? You're like, no vouchers, no hotel, no nothing. After this 17-year-old's flight from Toronto to Winnipeg was cancelled, Air Canada did not offer hotel accommodation. Instead, she and other passengers were given those yoga mats to sleep on. Today, the House of Commons Transport Committee launched an investigation into the travel situation, calling on the transport minister to testify as soon as possible. And airport problems aside, passengers are also increasingly frustrated with airlines themselves, accusing them of denying compensation they should be paying. But as Sophia Harris shows us, the airlines see it very differently. It was horrible. Lee and Frank Michael had a rough trip home from Victoria. Their flight was cancelled and Air Canada couldn't find them a hotel room, so they slept overnight at the Vancouver airport. I've got arthritis, I'm, I'm aching and sore, I'm sleeping on a freaking concrete uh, floor. I know it's carpeted, but you can feel the cold coming straight up through that concrete. The couple's initial flight to Victoria was also delayed, so they filed a claim with Air Canada for $2,800 in compensation. Air Canada rejected the claim, stating the flight disruptions were due to crew constraints linked to COVID-19 and were safety-related. Under federal rules, passengers are only compensated if the flight disruption is within the airline's control. Airlines also don't have to pay if the disruption was because of a safety issue. The Michaels argue staffing is within an airline's control. It's not a safety issue. It's a management issue. You have to manage your resources. In principle, the Canadian Transportation Agency agrees and forced WestJet to pay up last month after it denied a passenger compensation due to a crew shortage. Airlines largely control things like staffing, things like the scheduling of their crews. Airlines are expected to have solid contingency plans for crew to make sure that they have the crew necessary this air passenger rights expert says the CTA needs to be doling out harsh punishments to make sure airlines compensate when they're supposed to. That's the major concern, is that the regulator is not exactly striking fear into the hearts of the carriers to make them follow the rules. Air Canada says it abides by federal air passenger regulations and shouldn't be penalized for cancelling flights for safety reasons. The hurtful thing is no apology. The Michaels now plan to file a complaint with the CTA, which is already dealing with a big backlog. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Toronto. In case you're wondering, it's not just Canada struggling with all this either. Australia's biggest airline is now asking its own managers to pitch in by pitching suitcases. For real, staff shortages at Qantas Airways are so bad, it's calling on at least 100 executives to work as baggage handlers for three months. Now, today, the head of Montreal Pride addressed yesterday's stunning last-minute cancellation of this year's Pride Parade, admitting to a simple but glaring oversight. Yesterday morning at 8 a.m., uh, then I was made aware that actually there was about 100 people that we needed that had to be hired that had never been asked to work. It was never done. 
So that is Simon Gamache telling CBC Montreal he doesn't know how the security issue was missed, but said it will be investigated. Cancelling the Pride Parade left thousands bitterly disappointed in Montreal yesterday, while thousands near Toronto were left fuming after a major music festival went right off the rails. Every day there was kind of an issue. Even yesterday during um, one of the sets, there was a lot of um, people in the crowds that weren't doing so well. I heard people, they were saying yesterday that we just paid to stand outside. That's how disappointed they were. Just some of those frustrated with organizers of the Cultureland Festival in the Toronto area over the weekend. After a chaotic first day, fans got quite the shock on day two because organizers suddenly changed the venue at the last minute to a new site over 40 kilometers away, stranding those without vehicles and prompting a string of artist cancellations. Organizers now say they plan to offer partial refunds. Now, after being postponed last winter by COVID-19, the World Junior Hockey Championship is set to return to the ice tomorrow in Edmonton. This is normally a hugely popular event with games often selling out, but this year the buzz is muted and it's not just the awkward summer timing. As Aaron Collins shows us, the controversy surrounding organizer Hockey Canada is putting some fans off. Canada's best junior hockey players back on the ice, but the big story at these World Juniors is off of it. Hockey Canada dealing with allegations that past junior team members sexually assaulted women and that the organization used a fund supported by membership fees to settle sexual assault claims. Part of a toxic culture, Hockey Canada says it's committed to changing. We've acknowledged it. Uh, we've recognized that there's steps have been taken. We did a sexual violence thing. We did a code of conduct thing. Uh, but the big thing we hammer on these guys is that, uh, you know, in this profession, uh, at these big events, you go pro, you're under the spotlight. But the damage may already be done for some fans. Ticket sales for the tournament usually sold out in Canada, way down. Part of the reason could be the tournament's midsummer timing, but some are turned off by the scandal. The whole thing surrounding Hockey Canada is, is not, doesn't sit well. So, I mean, supporting them with my hard-earned money, I don't think that's uh, it's not, it's not, not a choice I would make right now. Sheldon Kennedy knows about secrecy and sexual abuse in junior hockey. The former NHLer was sexually assaulted by his junior coach in the 80s. Kennedy says the time has come to change the culture of hockey in Canada. The human side of the game has to be our number one priority. It doesn't matter whether you're competing for a gold medal. doesn't matter if you're just deciding to sign up Johnny Julie in, in minor hockey or, you know, let's try hockey. And that possibility that fewer kids could take up the game could be a growing problem for Hockey Canada, which collects registration fees from minor hockey associations across the country. It's a paramount for Hockey Canada to get the trust back of the average hockey parent um, in order to make sure that these things uh, aren't going to be hurting their numbers and, and registrations in the years to come. A shadow hanging over the ice as this year's World Juniors gets set to start. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. We have new details tonight about Hockey Canada's handling of a high-profile sexual assault claim. CBC News has learned the organization dropped a non-disclosure agreement with the woman allegedly sexually assaulted by a group of players in 2018. Ashley Burke has more on why that happened and the growing push to ban NDAs in sexual assault cases. I, Scott Smith, do swear that the evidence I shall give... Just days before Hockey Canada faced a public grilling last month, it approached the complainant of the 2018 alleged group sex assault and asked if she wanted her non-disclosure agreement withdrawn. We offered that on a proactive basis. Hockey Canada's president said it was because players were commenting publicly through lawyers and they wanted to give the complainant a chance to. Today we learned from her lawyer the NDA was officially withdrawn and new details about the original terms. She did have some flexibility to say what she wanted to say, um, which she did, which was that she didn't really want to be part of the media and... Uh, you know, she, she doesn't want to add to this, this debate publicly. The move comes amid a movement to completely ban NDAs in sexual assault and harassment cases. This year, PEI became the first province to do so. Nova Scotia and Manitoba introduced similar bills, and there are calls for the federal government to do the same. 
I would say Hockey Canada is doing a really great job of making my point on that for me. If somebody is placed under an NDA, they can't speak about what happened to them. And that means that this problem simply goes underground and continues. This woman signed a non-disclosure agreement two years ago after reporting her boss sexually harassed her at work. I was told that I had no option if I wanted to settle. CBC News has agreed to keep her identity confidential over her concerns about possible legal repercussions. She said she tried to negotiate her NDA to protect other victims. I said, well, what if it happens again and this person and another victim finds out about me and then comes to me, can I then share my story with that person? And the answer was no. But some lawyers who negotiate NDAs say outright banning them could hurt victims. Because I can get women, oftentimes, a million dollar plus settlements. And if there was an NDA, I'd get a tenth of that or less. So who at the end is disadvantaged by abolishing NDA? The victims. So this is really anti-victim legislation. So Ashley, I understand you asked Hockey Canada how often it uses NDAs for sexual abuse claims. What did it say? Adrian, Hockey Canada has reached 21 other settlements for sexual abuse allegations since 1989. But today in a statement said NDAs weren't used in every single one of those cases. In some instances, complainants were only prohibited from disclosing how much they received. Hockey Canada said it would work to drop NDAs if complainants requested that. All right, Ashley Burke in Ottawa. Thanks, Ashley. In central Newfoundland tonight, a sense of guarded relief, even as two major wildfires still threaten communities and cut off a major highway. Henrika Wilhelm shows us today's lucky break. The outlook for central Newfoundland now a good deal brighter, with the worst case scenario avoided for now. The two major fires that still threaten the region did not join together. The relative humidity was higher than anticipated. The temperatures were a little lower and the wind speeds were lower and we had a lower cloud ceiling. So that, that all worked in our favors. One big development, Environment Canada lifted its air quality warning in four of the five affected areas. That's due to a shift in the wind. We we're very fortunate. Mother Nature was on our side. There is also substantial rain forecast for Tuesday. On the weekend, helicopters and ambulances were transferring vulnerable patients from hospital and long-term care to other regions. The fire was getting uncomfortably close to Grand Falls, Windsor, uh, but would reach him. Um, but the, the smoke and the intensity of the smoke was another concern. Now, the improving conditions have led the health department to pause that. In nearby Bishop's Falls, the fire is about 25 kilometers away. Residents are asked to be prepared to leave at a moment's notice. Have your medicines ready, uh, eyeglasses, um, essential items, and, uh, and uh, a light bag of clothing just in case. The situation remains very fluid and highly dependent on the weather, but the proximity of the fire is really noticeable again here and now, with a faint smell of smoke in the air and a giant smoke cloud on the horizon. Henrike Wilhelm, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. Tonight, many Canadians are remembering Bill Graham. The former Liberal cabinet minister took part in historic decisions about this country's place in the world. He also served as leader of the opposition, facing down a former prime minister who tonight pays tribute to him. Marina von Stackelberg shows us why. Honorable leader of the opposition. Bill Graham, first elected as a Toronto MP to the House of Commons in 1993. He's being remembered by his former colleagues. He was amazing because he was so brilliant and had an encyclopedic knowledge of everything, but he was funny and was, you know, had the most amazing quips and irreverent at times. But, you know, as we all say that, that you couldn't help but admire and appreciate his brain, his heart and his spirit. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau writing, he was a dedicated public servant, a strong leader and a respected expert in his field. His accomplishments, dedication and service will remain an inspiration to Canadians. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Under the Jean Chrétien Liberal government, Graham served as Foreign Affairs Minister post 9-11. He led Canada's decision in 2003 to not join the American invasion of Iraq. He was later appointed Minister of National Defence. 
In that job, he convinced the Liberals to increase the defence budget by $13 billion. Former Prime Minister Paul Martin, who knew Graham since law school, says he will remember his energy and dedication, writing, Bill helped our government and the country navigate a challenging period of history as we deployed into Kandahar in southern Afghanistan. Graham was also a major advocate for LGBTQ rights. He was an early supporter of same-sex marriage in Canada. It was the time when we just adopted the uh, marriage bill, equal marriage bill in the House of Commons. We were very proud of that. Then, when the Conservatives came to power in 2006, Graham served as interim leader of the Liberal Party. Former Prime Minister Stephen Harper writing, even while a determined opponent, Bill was always a gentleman and he always kept the best interests of the country in mind. Our thoughts and prayers are with his family. We're, we're going to miss him a great deal. Bill Graham was 83 years old. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. The Canadian music world mourns a punk rock icon. We've lost a, a you know, a rock and roll guitar legend. That's really what we've lost. Up next, the tragic death police are investigating as a homicide. A Ukrainian nuclear plant under Russian control at the center of global concern. This is an incredibly dangerous moment. The push to let international inspectors in. And move over Mustang Sally, make way for Mustang Betty. We good to go? We're good to go. We go for a joyride with a woman who spent 54 years behind the wheel of her 68 Mustang. We are back in two. There is some difficult news tonight for fans of the Canadian punk rock band Teenage Head. Its guitarist, Gord Lewis, has been found dead. His brother told CBC News the 65-year-old was found yesterday at his apartment in Hamilton, Ontario. The family say his son was arrested in his death. Police did say today the 41-year-old Jonathan Lewis is charged with second-degree murder. Lewis was considered a trailblazer in the Canadian punk rock scene, rising to fame with Teenage Head in the 70s. We've lost a rock and roll guitar legend. That's really what we've lost. Someone who founded a band in the late 70s that was super influential over other bands. You look at the effect Teenage Head had on bands like the Tragically Hip, um, uh, hugely influential. His brother called him musically inspirational, loving and loyal, and said his family is devastated by the death. A family in Edmonton is seeking justice tonight after the death of a 16-year-old girl. She was found unresponsive more than two years ago after spending the night out in the freezing cold in the parking lot of Canada's largest mall. Janice Johnson takes us through the case and the current search for answers. I'm going to try not to cry today. Debbie Sandberg wants to know why her 16-year-old granddaughter was left to freeze in a mall parking lot. She's suing West Edmonton Mall and the operator of this entertainment complex, alleging Jasmine Kyle's death was the result of their negligence. On a cold December night three years ago, the 16-year-old told her family she was going to a movie and sleepover with a friend. Instead of going to the movie, they actually ended up at the rec room. Surveillance video shows Jasmine leaving the rec room just before 7. She and her friends were spotted in the parking lot drinking and throwing snowballs. The last time Jasmine was on camera, she was running up the stairs chasing another girl. A half hour later, someone called the mall about an intoxicated female passed out. It was minus 10 degrees. The autopsy report states mall security did search but could not find anyone. How could they have not found her for seven hours? It wasn't until 3 a.m. when a snowplow operator found Jasmine's body, wedged between a concrete barrier since removed and this cement wall. Constable Brady Dreyer and his partner were first on scene. They tried to save the teen's life. We knew that Jasmine needed help, which is why we started uh, CPR in the parking lot. They took her to a hospital in the back of the police car, but she couldn't be saved. Jasmine had a school ID, and I remember uh, seeing her smile in the photo, and she had this really nice, kind smile. I think about that whenever I think about this case. The lawsuit won't bring Jasmine back but it may give her family some answers. It's our job to go forward and, and 
show that this was preventable. In an email to CBC, Cineplex offered condolences to the family. West Edmonton Mall did not respond to our requests for comment. Statements of defense have not been filed. Janice Johnson, CBC News, Edmonton. When we come back, special coverage from our CBC News team in Sri Lanka. We take you inside the capital's biggest market where these days business is not booming. As people suffer under a collapsing economy, how the country got here and the voices at the heart of the matter. Next. Welcome back. Tonight, we take you once again inside Sri Lanka, a country pushed into economic despair. The blame seems to fall squarely on a ruling elite convinced it had all the answers. Salima Shibji has been giving us close-up portraits of the everyday pain being felt there. And tonight, she puts a spotlight on the powerful resentment against those leaders. The former ruling family has been pushed out, but their strong-arm tactics remain. The pain of a country whose economy is in ruins is inescapable at the largest market in Sri Lanka's capital. Once thriving, now much quieter. It's hard to make a sale, Mohammed Ikram says, with food prices so high. Ten people will stop, but only two will buy something. The same at this stall, where Kishal Da says he's surviving most days eating only rice and dried fish. No president, no good. He puts the blame squarely on the political class for the suffering across the country. That rage and frustration against the ruling elite spilled out onto the streets last month. Thousands of Sri Lankans occupied government buildings, pushing out now former President Gotabaya Rajapaksa ending his family's political dynasty, a grip on power that left Sri Lanka hurtling towards economic collapse. At one level, it is the basic incompetence. At another level, it is the arrogance of not listening. A dangerous combo, this analyst says, when you add Rajapaksa's affinity for eccentric policies. They restricted the tax base, which lost the Treasury something like 600 billion uh, rupees. Then. They decided, or he decided, to move to organic fertilizer for agriculture overnight. A disastrous move that wreaked havoc. But the government carried on blindly, ignoring persistent warnings that financial ruin was looming. Until it came, and Sri Lanka defaulted on its debt, no longer able to pay for essential imports like fuel and medicine. The months-long protest movement may have forced the president to flee, but those still at the camp say his successor, longtime politician Ranil Wickremesinghe, isn't much better. He's cracking down on the demonstrators with multiple arrests and warnings to clear out the remaining tents, leaving protesters bristling. Days after that warning from police, this is what the main protest site across from the presidential offices looks like. Quiet, that fear lingering of a further crackdown. And he's just proving himself as a dictatorial leader, just like the Rajapaksas were. This full-time protester is nervous and feeling dejected. Once vocal, she's now too scared of being arrested to show her face. And he's not the kind of system change that we've been asking for for the last four months, so we're not satisfied with his leadership. We don't know where it's going to go. After an unprecedented political reckoning, deep uncertainty over what comes next for a country mired in debt, trying to navigate the front path to recovery. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Colombo. After the break, we're going to look at the global concern about a nuclear plant in Ukraine under Russian control. It is not possible to run a nuclear power plant safely with a gun pointed at you. The push to let international investigators in. There are some new warnings today from high-level officials that Europe's largest nuclear plant could be on the brink of disaster. Ukraine's Zaporizhia power plant was hit by shelling over the weekend. As Breyer Stewart reports, the UN is asking Russia to allow international inspectors to check the plant. 
Europe's largest nuclear reactor has been under control by Russian forces since the early days of the war, but over the weekend it came under fire again. These images by Russian appointed officials in Ukraine's Zaporizhzhia region appear to show the moment the area was hit and then the aftermath. Russia blames the Ukrainian military, while Ukraine says it's Russia who's waging nuclear terror. If something happens, so there will be uh, huge consequences, not only for Ukraine, probably all Ukraine will be uh, contaminated, uh, but for Europe as well. Ukrainian officials say three radiation sensors were damaged. Russia says power lines were brought down. The UN is urging inspectors with the International Atomic Energy Agency to be allowed at the site. Any attack to a nuclear plant is a suicidal thing, and I hope that uh, those attacks uh, will end. The plant lies just east of an area that Ukraine is trying to take back from Russia. In the nearby city of Enohodar, people already surrounded by war now fear another disaster. It could be another Chernobyl or even worse, said this man. This is an incredibly dangerous moment. Nicholas Roth, a nuclear expert, says the ongoing war means there's a risk of a radiation leak or even an explosion if one of the tanks carrying spent fuel was hit. He says the situation is particularly precarious because Russia controls the facility but Ukrainian workers still operate it. It is not possible to run a nuclear power plant safely with a gun pointed at you. I think there's enormous risk there. And that danger remains, even if the plant doesn't come under direct attack again. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Some good news here. The world's top tennis players are in Canada for the National Bank Open. It's a hugely competitive women's field, and women who follow in the footsteps of legends like Billie Jean King. Women have to be perceived as leaders for everyone, not just for women. When we come back, we revisit our conversation with the trailblazing tennis star, her fight to break barriers and take on bullies. Next. Well, the great Serena Williams has her first singles win in over a year on day one of the National Bank Open in Toronto. Straight sets, but it wasn't easy. That is a moment right there. Williams moving on to the second round in a tournament bursting with standout female players, including Serena's sister Venus Williams, Naomi Osaka, Canada's own Bianca Andrescu and Leila Fernandez. And long before those powerful women ever picked up a racket, there was the great Billie Jean King blazing the trail. You can bet she is watching this tournament closely. Last summer, I had the privilege of speaking with King about her legacy and the changing face of a sport she has helped to define. It's a fool's game to try to single out the most meaningful honour ever given to Billie Jean King. More than enough that Elton John wrote the song Philadelphia Freedom about her, that President Barack Obama gave her the nation's highest honor. All that as spectacular as her 39 Grand Slam tennis titles. Plus that win for the ages in the 1973 Battle of the Sexes against self-proclaimed chauvinist Bobby Ricks. And yes, there was a movie made of it, because of course there was. $100,000 to any woman who can beat Bobby Ricks. Is she out there and does she have the nerve? I'm done to live that her. life of using sport to push the for equality earns more than enough stories to fill the 500 page autobiography all in. Do you like to write a lot? Sure, I guess you have to for, for sure, the show, right? Getting to those stories and her plans for what's next means first crossing the gauntlet of the Billie Jean King interrogation. I can't believe where you traveled to. Did you play hockey as a kid? No, I, I no. What I do you like parents? to do away from? Uh, she fires like off questions as swift as her serves. We sat down to talk or try to talk virtually. How are you? I'm I'm extraordinarily well. This is uh, this is the most exciting thing that's happened to me in a long time. Really? <laughs> you better get a better life going here. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> How'd you know you wanted to be a journalist? Then we'll get started. Sorry. I, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't start asking you. I know, I'm in trouble, you're in trouble. Go ahead, go for it, Adrian. You know, I, I remember watching you with 
your blue suede tennis shoes were the most radical thing I think I'd ever seen in my life. I had to argue with Adidas to do this. I argued with them like crazy in 72. I said, I want a colored pair. Because colored television had been there maybe four years, three years. And I didn't want to have all white in tennis anyway. I didn't think it was good for our sport. I had those shoes for the King Riggs match, which was great. It was fun. I understand that, that love of, of hitting the ball and feeling the impact. But what I'm curious about is the first times when you realized the inequities in it. Like, what, what happened? Uh, I was daydreaming at the Los Angeles Tennis Club when I was 12, and I, you know, I realized everybody wore white shoes, white socks, white clothes, and everybody who played was white. And I thought to myself, where is everyone else? And that was the epiphany moment. That was what kind of put me on this course of equality the rest of my life. Money started to enter the picture later in my mind that people understood money, and that would be a good uh, way to try to help correct things. Hard to fathom now, but in the late 60s, when Billie Jean King was number one in the world, she wasn't earning enough to support herself. The men were fine. So she helped form a women's league, threatened boycotts to push for equality, ultimately agreeing in 1973 to play in the battle of the sexes against former tennis champion and loudmouth Bobby Riggs. The last shot sank into the net and the old lion was a gracious loser. She beat him in straight sets. You have to talk about Bobby Riggs. It's, it's, it's impossible not to have the conversation. You're correct. Um, <laughs> did you just want to deck him sometimes? Just for maybe a moment or two, but I think he knew nothing about me. I knew a lot about him, but dominant groups know nothing about subdominant groups. This guy finally was getting some attention that he probably deserved a lot younger in life, so I got it. But when he got to be a little too much, I did call him, that, that, I said, you're a jerk or you're a creep or something, and he got upset with me, but I was just scared to death if I lost. We may lose everything we'd fought for, and we just were getting started. Mm -hmm. And I knew we had 90 million people watching us in the world, that I knew that was my one opportunity. Because I wondered if beyond the, the spectacle of it that, that is seared in people's minds, how important that moment actually was. Uh, mm -hmm. Ever since that match, particularly um, when I was younger, women would run up to me and say that changed their life in that it gave them more self-confidence. It gave them um, the courage to maybe ask for a raise or ask for equal pay. Uh, men come up to me, they're more calm and reflective, um, sometimes tears in their eyes. You know, I've had a daughter and a, and a son and I want, I want my daughter to have equal opportunity with my son. I, and I don't know if I would have thought like that if I hadn't seen that match or experienced mm -hmm. it. It became clear to Billie Jean King what she did and said was all public fodder, including her most private struggles. While still with her husband, she had an affair with a woman. Then, in 1981, the woman blackmailed her, sued her, and outed her. For someone who is so open and so strong, you were denied an opportunity to come out on your own terms. Like, I'm, I'm really sorry to, to read of what you went through because it feels like that was stolen from you. Yeah, that feels like it was stolen. Absolutely, I didn't get to do it in my own terms, and I always want everyone to be able to make any announcement about themselves, particularly it's about their sexuality and their how they identify, um, to be able to say it when they're ready. But I also was pushed further into the closet because during the tour in the, in the early 70s, they told me, you can't talk about what you're feeling or thinking at all about your sexuality or else we're not going to have a tour. And that made it, I mean, that made it simple, <laughs> didn't it? I'm not going to say anything. I want the tour to make it. And there's not, this isn't just about me. Is, is that why you wrote a, this book? Is, is, is this like a do-over in, in a way? Now I'm older. I've lived a lot of life since the 70s. I have spent over four years on this. Um, constantly, every day, living it, thinking it, writing. And even when I did the audio part of the, for the book, you know, reading it, uh, it was so overwhelming. And I mean, I'd stop and put my, cry and put my, you know, my head on my hands and then I'd get over it and then we'd start again. What, what were the tears for? Reliving the things in this book, whether it's the sexuality, whether it's, it's um, just trying to get equal pay. 
But these are my ups and downs. These are my journey, and um, maybe it'll help somebody. What is it like for you now to watch these players, these women players, find their voices, the likes of the great Naomi Osaka, and say, hey, my terms. I'm, I'm going to try to do this on my terms. No, what? for me, it's wonderful. This is what we fought for, that we'd have a platform so uh, women could talk and say what's on their mind and try to push the envelope. Naomi is doing that, which I think is fantastic. Uh, but I do think that when a person wants to be a professional athlete, which we are a performer, uh, we're in the entertainment business, that talking to the media is extremely important because without you, we wouldn't be making the money we make. But to her point about, you know, that when the cameras come after a match that maybe you haven't done well in and you are in that lonely moment, is there not a cruelty there? I always looked at each person that was a journalist there, a writer, and I would say, well, this is what they do for their job, just like I play mm -hmm. tennis for my job. So to me, we were in this together. Are you going to get some uh, jerks? Absolutely. You're going to get a few, but they're very few. But it's very important not to take things personally either. Have you had this conversation with Naomi Osaka? No, I have not yet. We do text and all that, but I try to stay out of, out of it. I mean, if she wants my opinion, I will give it to her. But I, the most important thing with any human being that I know is I want them to be all right, emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. I see that desire in you to, to keep pushing, 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 and changing. I mean, it, there's a reason why it's the last line in your book, the, the we're not done yet. You know, equality and, and equity starting to be talked about a lot more the last few years, finally. I'm like, ah, oh, finally. Women have to be perceived as leaders for everyone, not just for women. But in my heart and mind, because I grew up with a brother, been married to a male, been married to a female, I'm for everybody. So, and we've got transgenders, we've got, we, we're not in a binary world anymore. We have to think differently. Um, and the young ones, I really have faith in them. I think they're, I think they're gonna do great. Thank you very much, you take care. Thanks, Adrian. All right. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Listen, there's something amazing about getting to talk with the people you've admired since you were a kid. She is a great sport, and Billie Jean King might very well be impressed with the tenacity of the next woman you're about to meet. I really like this car. I've always liked this car. So this is Betty and her 68 Ford Mustang, the pair of them still going strong. Up next. Behold, Betty Shaw and her 1968 Ford Mustang. Now, Betty bought her car that year. She hasn't stopped driving it since. So for over 50 years, Betty has driven that Mustang, is not going to stop it, is not going to sell it. She takes us along for a joy ride. So get ready to listen to that motor purr or growl in tonight's moment. We good to go? We're good to go. 1968, April 23rd, 10 to 7 at night, pouring rain. I got there just before the dealership closed. I remember because my dad's birthday is on the 24th, and when he got up in the morning, he said, it's my birthday today, Bets, can I take your car to work? I go, no. <laughs> When you bought a car, you didn't take them out for a test drive. You just told them what you wanted, what engine you wanted, what color you wanted, and it came with four tires and a steering wheel. It did not have power steering or power brakes, but when it was new, everybody thought I had power steering and power brakes. That's how nice she drove. She was beautiful right from the beginning. <laughs> the radio you could get, but that was extra. I really like this car. I've always liked this car. And I think the longer I have it, the more I like it. Do not let it go, Betty. I had a friend with a 69 uh, Firebird, a 350. I could hear it growling miles away. Kept it for 25 years. Regrets selling it. Don't let it go. That is the National for August the 8th. Good night. <laughs>